From the Watson Institute at Brown University, this is Trending Globally. I'm Trending Globally's producer and your guest host, Dan Richards. On this episode, part two of my conversation with journalist and Watson visiting fellow Dan Denver about his new book, All American Nativism, how the bipartisan war on immigrants explains politics as we know it. In the book, he explores the long, disturbing history of nativism in the U.S. and the fundamental role it plays in our politics today. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I'd recommend going back and giving that a listen first. We'll put a link in the show notes. Later on in this interview, we look at some of the incredible work activists have done in the last 15 years to advance the rights of immigrants and how these struggles fit into a new vision for American politics. We pick up here, though, in the early 2000s, when strains of American nativism were revived and reconfigured as a result of the, quote, war on terror. Here is Dan Denver. There are sort of two very deeply interrelated post-9-11 stories in the immediate years with regard to immigration. There's the institutional story and the political The institutional story is that immediately after 9-11, massive amounts of funding went to immigration as an enforcement issue, as a security issue under the new Department of Homeland Security, within which everything was reorganized around the logic of preventing terrorist attacks. And so the amount of money going for immigration enforcement just surged enormously after the attacks. That wasn't the product of a kind of nativist movement on the ground demanding that. That was a product of the logic of of homeland security politics within which immigration politics had been kind of subsumed. But on the political level, right before 9-11, George W. Bush had started this dialogue with his Mexican counterpart, Vicente Fox. They went, Vicente Fox addressed a a joint session of Congress. They, They went on a a trip together, I believe, like around the U.S., kind of meeting with different groups and giving different talks. This was all supposed to lay the groundwork for some kind of grand bargain around, you know, finally solving the problem of Mexican undocumented immigrants in in the U.S., taking advantage of the fact that the sort of tempers of the mid of the early and mid '90s had had, had subsided. Right. This was like an era of uh, quote compassionate conservatism from George yeah. W. Bush. Yeah, he spoke a little bit of Spanish. Um, he was supposed to be conservatism with a you know a, with softer edges, right? And you know um, the, the the act was not ineffective. I don't remember the percentages off the top of my head, but George W. Bush did rather well with Hispanic Latino voters, right? In two thousand, and uh, you know George W. Bush by no means one would not have described his politics as explicitly nativist in in any kind of notable way that wasn't he, he did not stick out from <laughs> amongst other politicians from either party as a particularly native i mean in fact he tried to present himself as 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 a friend to to hispanic latino voters but 911 just blows that right off the table as all the institutions of repression against immigrants that have been built over the years prior to 9-11 are ramped up just to a totally new level as part of the domestic corollary to the war on terror, which is the construction of this massive national security state. I believe it's around 2004 that Bush does start to float the idea, maybe 2003, 2004, of of picking immigration reform back up. And uh, he immediately gets massive blowback. The response from the right is no way in hell. Anything that legalizes any undocumented immigrant in this country is tantamount to amnesty. And amnesty is the enemy. In these groups that we talked about, I think in our earlier interview, part of this, you know, so-called Tanton network of, of nativist organizations founded beginning in nineteen right. seventy nine. The ophthalmologist or yes. orthodontist. I, ophthalmologist. Ophthalmolo- very uh I mean really remarkable ophthalmologist who yeah one of the more influential ophthalmologists in american history perhaps yeah and i um they they were mobilized against it and uh you know began to work closely with right-wing talk radio 
Um, it became more of an issue on on Fox News. You have Lou Dobbs, um, who now fittingly is is at Fox News, but at the time is a top host on on CNN, and every night is spitting out virulent anti immigrant propaganda. And so the Democratic and Republican establishment's response to this, George W. Bush's response to this, is to support a project a uh, uh, called comprehensive immigration reform. What makes it comprehensive? What that's what CIR is a euphemism for is combining the legalization or of undocumented workers, the pathway to citizenship, combining that with guest worker programs that will please business because businesses want workers to come here as workers, but not like people. Right. Um, and with m- more enforcement to please the nativists, both at the border and in in the interior um you know like we need to deal with this these people are living in the shadows but you know create new strong measures that will ensure that no more undocumented workers come here in the future basically right finally solve the problem and the the nativists aren't impressed with this proposal because what they want is just more enforcement and they would like to see the undocumented population not not legalized but deported all of them this new push for comprehensive immigration reform is that what like you're saying kind of inflamed a new sort of sense of nativism or what reactivated these groups at that time that was part of it another part of it was the way that border militarization in the 1990s and also changes in the economy had restructured migration routes so there were increasingly large pockets of of recently arrived undocumented immigrants in places like Arizona whereas in the 1990s California was the epicenter of anti-immigrant politics in the 2000s that became Arizona and that's also where not coincidentally undocumented migration routes had been shifted thanks to border militarization we also saw migrants increasingly in small towns and places small small towns and cities in places like uh, northeastern Pennsylvania, in the Poconos, across the south. And so that, I think, also laid the groundwork for the, this this dispersal of undocumented immigration into areas that were hotbeds of conservative politics and reactionary politics already, combined with the reintroduction of the issue at the national level through this new push for some form of legalization, some pathway to citizenship as part of comprehensive immigration reform that combined with the with right-wing media really seizing upon this as a productive culture war issue all of these things combined in the mid-2000s to make immigration re-emerge as a powerful point of political conflict and in a lot of ways it looked a lot like what we saw in the 90s what was new is that muslims began to play a star role as as villains in the anti-immigrant imaginary. As a result of the increasingly obvious failure of the war on terror, rather than 9-11 proximately, it's 9-11, then the war on terror, then the failure of the war on terror that provokes this mass emergence of, of Islamophobic politics. And that links very closely with this 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 reemergent anti-Mexican, anti-Latin American nativist politics of 1990s vintage. And one thing I can read that uh, I think really well encapsulates what this looked like. It was it was a border security alert sent out in October 2005 by John Culberson. I have no idea if that's how his name is pronounced. A uh, a Houston Republican member of Congress sent out in October 2005. He wrote, Al-Qaeda terrorists and Chinese nationals are infiltrating our country virtually anywhere they choose from Brownsville to San Diego. And a large number of Islamic individuals have moved into homes in Nuevo Laredo and are being taught Spanish to assimilate with the local culture. Full-scale war is underway on our southern border and our entire way of life is at risk if we do not win the battle for Laredo. 
So the failure of the war on terror to deliver the promised uh, kind of westernizing liberty to the Muslim world, which of course was the pretext for the neoconservative pretext for the war on terror, ricochets back into this new kind of garrison state mentality on the right, where it's where it's not the U.S. that's invading the Muslim world, but in fact Muslims posing as Mexicans who are invading across the U.S. border with Mexico, which of course did not happen. Um, there's never ever been a, a plotting terrorist suspect caught at the U.S.-Mexican border or found to have crossed the U.S.-Mexican border. That did not stop John Kerry, though. Kerry of accusing Bush in, two, in the 2004 election of uh, of saying of that the borders are more leaking today than they were before 9-11. And quote, we now have people from the Middle East allegedly coming across the border. That's what John Kerry, the Democratic nominee, said to George W. Bush during a debate. It was totally false. Um, and so we had people on the right picking that up, but it was also this generalized idea that the Muslim threat and the Mexican threat were increasingly intertwined. Right. So I want to jump ahead a little bit from the mid-2000s to the Obama administration, uh, because you, you spend a good portion of the book talking about the Obama administration as well. And there were things that people were very concerned about on the nativist right. There was a lot of concern about Obama becoming president. And I think on in some progressive circles, there was a lot of excitement for him and the different types of changes an Obama administration might bring. But once he was elected, it in many ways, these big radical systemic changes did not come to pass. Um, so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how the Obama administration handled these types of issues. Yeah. I mean, some of the big, the hopes for big radical changes were were projected onto Obama. Of course. See, I think in a lot of ways, he indicated pretty strongly that he wanted to be a continuation of, of the Democratic Party, that, that he was the nominee for as we had known it but and on immigration he was very much a continuation of of the bush administration the bush administration had reacted to the nativist right by pushing uh comprehensive immigration reform and when that failed engaging in these standalone escalations to try to win credibility with the nativist right bush during his 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 last four years emphasized uh not only more border militarization but work these workplace raids Obama dialed down workplace raids, but really started expanding immigration enforcement through what scholars call crimigration, which refers to all of these various ways in which in recent decades, the immigration enforcement system and criminal justice system have become intertwined. And he did this in two significant ways. One was a program called 287G, which allowed the federal government to essentially deputize local law enforcement and jail as immigration enforcers. If you if you're a police department, if you're a sheriff department, let's say Maricopa County, Arizona, run by Joe Arpaio, and you sign a 287G agreement with the Department of Homeland Security, then your agents can make immigration arrests as though they are ICE agents. Mm. And so those started under Bush in the early 2000s after 9-11, and they uh, were also used by the Obama administration. The centerpiece, perhaps, though, of Obama's immigration enforcement strategy was a program called Secure Communities, which was initiated under George Bush, but really rolled out under Obama. And what it did was combine an FBI database that pretty much maybe every law enforcement agency in the country uses uh, comprising comprised of fingerprints of everyone arrested in the country. What secure communities did, a very neat but incredibly damaging maneuver, is connect that database with an ICE database of undocumented, likely undocumented immigrants. And so now... Every single time someone was arrested in this country, which is a lot of people all the time because we have a mass incarceration system that means that people are constantly coming into contact with the criminal justice system for offenses, small, medium, and large. Every time 
someone is arrested from Los Angeles to middle of nowhere, Kansas, and they're fingerprinted, that fingerprint going into what was just the FBI system is also pinging through the ICE system. And if a match was made, then ICE would contact that local law enforcement agency and ask for the suspected undocumented immigrant to be detained until they could pick them up. And Obama defended this in the terms of, in terms of, we are not deporting the hardworking immigrant. We're deporting the dangerous criminal immigrant. But Obama soon reached record deportations, which raised a lot of questions about who exactly he was deporting. And indeed, data showed that many people who were being deported were convicted of no crime at all or very minor crimes. And Obama continued Bush's model, using these standalone escalations of enforcement to try to win over, to win credibility with the right wing so that they would vote for comprehensive immigration reform. That didn't happen. But what what did happen is he infuriated a core part of his base, particularly Latinos. And as a result, what we saw was the more militant left wing of the immigrant rights movement break off from the D.C. establishment that was still defending Obama and trying to train their fire on Republicans to get Republicans to support comprehensive immigration reform. But what the more militant wing did, groups like the National Day Laborers Organizing Network, is say, you know, no, you are, you Obama, yeah, Republicans are evil, we know that, but you Obama are president and you're taking a, the affirmative act of deporting our family members. So we're going to protest you until they stop. And so that it was that movement that really challenged the whole premise and logic and theory of change of comprehensive immigration reform. And what those immigrant rights activists won was incredible, which is not only DACA, the protection for undocumented young people who came here as children, but also DAPA, which would have gone to the parents of, of US citizens, which was blocked on court, unfortunately. But what they also won was a massive massive reduction in deportations by the end of Obama's um, final years in office. And that's absolutely no credit to Obama because what Obama was doing was winning record deportations, but the movement forced him to change course successfully. And so the, the movement forced him to change course in the sense that whoever was going to come after him, like he wasn't going to be running for an election again. If he had really felt in principle like what he was doing was right in terms of record deportations, he could have continued. Yeah, I can't get inside Obama's head and maybe right. maybe there'll be, you know, memos and things that are released at some at some point that will allow historians to better explain the the reasoning within the Obama administration. Right. As they as as those people understood it. It seems as though Obama was engaging in these these record deportations to, to win credibility with the right while taking his left base, particularly immigrants, particularly Latinos, for granted. And what the left of the immigrant rights movement that broke from an establishment that really, really resisted breaking with Obama, what the what the more militant groups did is they forced the White House to confront a changed calculus, which is that you doing this stuff to try to win credibility with with the right or with swing voters or with whoever um, is going to have a cost. And that cost is us, your base. And they persistently disrupted events, o Obama's speaking events and events from other Democratic officials. They and it was it, it, it and it was effective this kind of points to something you describe in the book which is that we're seeing a, a polarization over the topic of immigration and how to handle it in america and sort of a, a cleavage where there maybe once was more of a consensus um you also say that polarization in this context is a good thing and so i wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what is that polarization and how does it look and why do you see it as a uh, a good thing or a step forward. Yeah. So the war on immigrants that I describe in my book has been a bipartisan war on immigrants. And if you look at, at the history of polling 
on the issue. You see that in the early 1990s, when this this bipartisan war was really launched in earnest, that Democratic and Republican leaning voters on the ground held similar and similarly negative opinions about immigrants. And so the war, the bipartisan war on immigrants is launched with a real bipartisan basis. Lots of white Americans had negative feelings about immigrants. Lots of black Americans did. So did lots of Hispanic Americans at the time. So, you know, uh, Democrats and Republicans in the 1990s making attack on making these attacks on immigrants may have been morally repugnant, but it made a certain um, strategic, at least short term strategic sense. Voters were very open and receptive to it. Right. That begins to to change, particularly in the the mid 2000s, when Bush's renewed push for comprehensive immigration reform creates a kind of new, newly clear divide between left and right on immigration because his immigration reform proposal goes nowhere. Instead, what happens is in December 2005, the U.S. House passes this bill called the Sensenbrenner Bill, which is a draconian anti-immigrant bill that would make mere undocumented status in this country a criminal offense, which was then and remains now a civil offense. It would have made it a crime to be arrested and jailed for, not just deported. So that was a major escalation. It also would have potentially criminalized aiding undocumented immigrants, which worried all sorts of very ordinary charities that they're, including like the Catholic Church, that their activities would be criminalized. And so that bill went nowhere in the Senate because it was a, it for a variety of reasons was a bridge too far beyond the bounds of the framework of the bipartisan war on immigrants. What it did do is provoke a massive immigrant rights movement in 2006, one of the only significant social movements in the United States, along with the anti-Iraq war movement of the early part of that decade, one of the only significant social movements of that decade in this country, period. These protests were massive, and many people listening may recall hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in Los Angeles, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in Chicago, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in New York. In the heart of the demonstration, first in Broadway, downtown Los Angeles, May 1st, 2006, the people are speaking out. I was in Portland, Oregon at the time working as an organizer, and I don't remember the numbers there, but they were some of the biggest protests they were, that I had ever seen in, in Oregon. Um, and that was true in cities, small, medium, and large, everywhere across this country. And so it's then that you can start to see increasing partisan polarization. And it's very clear if you look at the the, his, the polling history in graph form, it just begins to diverge. And Democratic-leaning voter, voters are increasingly sympathetic to immigrants, while Republican-leaning voters remain anti-immigrant. That accelerates as the Obama administration provokes this a renewed round of immigrant rights mobilization against him. The Democratic voting base increasingly identifies and sympathizes with the organized immigrants. And then with Trump, that dynamic of polarization goes into overdrive. Because Trump tarnishes this entire bipartisan war on immigrants with his toxic brand, his brand that is toxic to anyone left of center of this country and many in the center, so center to left, and makes it appear for what it is, which is monstrously racist. And so suddenly there's this uncanny revelation that Trump provokes of this entire bipartisan history of mainstream xenophobia that he is both the product of and sort of the the, the successor to. And so that's why the polarization is good because the bipartisan war on immigrants no longer has a bipartisan basis. Even a Democrat with a long history in the in the party's establishment who has consistently voted and acted against immigrants like Joe Biden, the presumptive Democratic 
nominee will be operating under radically different political constraints on immigration than than Obama was thanks to the organized immigrant rights movement and the organized left in general. And that's no credit at all to to Biden. It's not because Biden's a better person than Obama. It's because the political conditions have changed. And being anti-immigrant now means being Republican to most ordinary Democratic voters. So there are also dangers here, of course, and Trump's election is is an example. While, While his war on immigrants is far less novel than many of his liberal and centrist detractors would like to believe um, it is intensified. It is more cruel. It is more expansive. And polling shows that Republicans are, while the percentage of Republicans that are anti-immigrant hasn't really changed, the qualitative way in which they're anti-immigrant has certainly gotten worse. And I mean, that's just clear for all of us to to see. Um, so that's that that's the danger. But at least there's there's clarity that um, the last decade of comprehensive immigration reform politics, the decade and a half, have shown very clearly that that nativist Republicans can't be negotiated with and that giving them more of what they want for free, i.e. more enforcement, more deportation, more border militarization, doesn't win them over to anything. It just makes them hungry for more and moves the goalposts and allows them, moves the Overton window further the bad news is that no sort of legislation legalizing undocumented immigrants will become a reality until Republicans are soundly defeated. Um, that's the bad news. The good news is that now that's clear. It sounds a little bit like what you're describing in a lot of the Democratic Party and just the left wing of American politics is like, something that's a little new. It's it's potentially getting off the track of this all-American nativism you're describing. Yeah. So what should people be asking of of those leaders and and hoping for in that movement? Well, my book is first and foremost a response to the establishment liberal notion that Trump is some sort of political extraterrestrial. And my argument is that he's fundamentally the product of American political history at its most normal in general, and in particular a product of the bipartisan war on immigrants in general and undocumented immigrants in particular, particularly as we've known it since the Clinton administration. So obviously my book holds Bill Clinton and Barack Obama just as responsible as George W. Bush for creating the political conditions that allow Donald Trump to become president and be presiding over this just monstrously nativist administration. That said, my my analysis of Obama, which is by no means flattering of him, does demonstrate that the organized left has, in this case, the immigrant rights movement, but it applies generally for the left, has, has power vis-a-vis a democratic administration that it does not have under Donald Trump. Um, and this is not saying, oh, like we can make we can make Joe Biden good. I mean, for those of us on the Bernie end of things, like we're never going to like Joe Biden. We're never going to forgive him for voting for the Iraq war. But I, I, I do think that we can learn from the Obama administration a lot about how organized social movements on the left can win concrete things under a Democratic administration, which is a credit to the movements, not to the Democratic president. So, you know, Bernie Sanders is already sort of leading the left's inside game mm-hmm. with Biden. We'll see how that shakes out. But the degree that it shakes out well, it's going to be because plenty of people are still playing the outside game and making sure that Biden thinks that not only through election day, but every day after it, if he wins, that he can't depend on the left's support and that he needs to keep trying to win it. That's the only way that the left has has power, not by capitulating, but not by giving up either. Both are giving up. Both 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 paths both of those paths are giving up just in different ways. One with kind of a radical vibe and one with a co-optation vibe. Right. And I I think something you show in this history or a, a sense I got after reading it was just how embedded 
these nativist ideas are in so much of American society and in so many of our institutions and that if we're going to want to push back on them, it's going to have to look different than traditional politics has at points. Yeah. I mean, one of my books, one of the, the, the through lines through my book is sort of that immigration politics is not just about what has narrowly been con- conceived of as immigration politics. I kind of argue that it's fundamentally tied up with everything else because I think everything's fundamentally tied up with everything and that analyses that aren't systematic and, and totalistic in some sense are, are tend to miss things. And, and so um, we're not going to change immigration politics until we change politics and economics more generally because – nativism, xenophobic scapegoating, Islamophobia, the, the the nationalism behind the the war on terror, all of this serves a certain function in American political economy, which is to tell us a particular story about who's responsible for the problems right. in their lives. And the immigrant liberation, immigrant freedom, immigrant legalization, all these all these things, however one wants to frame it, are fundamentally tied up with people in general in the United States telling a new story about who is responsible for their problems. And that's the story that that Bernie Sanders was telling during his campaign, which was incre- the most compelling effort in my lifetime on the left since the late 1990s to, to do that. It wasn't good enough. We didn't win. But it's no coincidence that it was Latino immigrants in particular and Latinos in general that were a core constituency for the Sanders movement, both in California and Nevada, which led to his victory in both those states. Bernie had a great immigration platform, but that's not why Latinos flocked to to him. Latinos are core figures in, in America's multiracial working class, and they responded to the same thing that everyone else who liked Bernie did. Free college for all, free health care for all, eliminating student debt. Um, all of these things that concretely tie the interests of everyone in this country together. And I so I think the the very fact that Latinos were at the core of this multiracial working class and downwardly mobile middle class coalition that made up the Bernie Sanders coalition, what I think that shows is precisely that 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 immigrant rights politics has to be embedded within a larger politics of of social, economic, and political change. Because the anti-immigrant movement is is very much embedded within a larger reactionary politics. The, the bad things are all tied together. So we can't just surgically remove one of them. We can't just like surgically remove right. anti-immigrant politics from our general hellscape scenario. We have to change the whole thing. Um, in part because with both immigration and foreign policy, those are unlikely to ever be top voting issues for majority of people. Realistically, how do we get people to care? We get people to care about it by by embedding it within a larger politics of things they do care about. Right. I, I think that's as good a place as any to leave it. But thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. And uh, thanks for this writing this book. It's incredible. And everyone should go read it. All American Nativism. We'll have a link in the uh, show description. Dan Denver, thanks for talking. Thank you very, very much for having me. This episode of Trending Globally was produced by me, Dan Richards, and Jackson Cantrell. Our theme music is by Henry Bloomfield. Additional music by the Blue Dot Sessions. You can find more episodes just like this by subscribing to us, Trending Globally, on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And if you haven't listened to Dan Denver's podcast, The Dig?, definitely subscribe to that while you're at it. For more information about this show and other podcasts produced by the Watson Institute, go to watson.brown.edu. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week for another episode of Trending Globally.